Um, thank you so much uh, for having me here today. Uh, my keynote today is called Job Title To Be Determined, and it basically covers my personal story as well as the importance of uh, the design industry at large and what changes need to happen in order to better accommodate people who, like me, are kind of jack of all trades but masters of none, uh, looking for progress and uh, just alternative ways of spreading out job opportunities uh, for freelancers as well as uh, entrepreneurs in general. So uh, to start off, uh, my name is Danny Roche and I am from Toronto, Canada. Uh, a little bit of background about me, I'm 27 years old. I am a token Scorpio, ESFJ personality type. I am adopted and I am an only child, but I am not bratty, I don't think. Uh, and I also hate tomatoes. Um, some nice words that have been said about me, according to Miss Fish, I am the coolest girl that you've never met, except I'm here with you right now, so you will meet me. Um, and Forbes has said that I am empowering independent creatives and gaining increased representation of Asian women in media and in business. Some of my clients include Bumble, L'Oreal, Google, Adidas, and Girlboss. And some of my features include Forbes, Vogue, Fashionista, High Society, and Kevator. Some more of my accolades and more about me. I've made a couple of 30 under 30 lists, including Forbes in advertising and marketing, as well as Canada's marketing magazine. So in short, uh, it's all about me. But what does this mean? And what do I do? And who am I even? Well. On paper, I think I am a creative director, a multidisciplinary designer, a fashion influencer, design professor, entrepreneur, nice person, and I am funny sometimes. But I think generally across the board, it's really difficult to pinpoint one specific title for ourselves. And I think we've all been there where we go to an event or a party and we're meeting someone new and they're like, hey, nice to meet you, who are you? And you're just like, oh, my name is Danny. And they respond with, uh, so what do you do? So what happens when you don't know the answer to that question? You're like extending your hand and you're like, I, I, I do, I'm nice, I'm a nice person. And that's not what they're looking for because our society really measures success and uh, like self-worth based off of accolades and what is on your resume and how you're able to present yourself at parties or the past 10 slides where I just talked about myself. That is what people are looking for. But what does it mean to be a good designer or a meaningful creator or someone who can actually connect with people in really like real authentic ways? So despite all the things that I just listed, I am still trying to figure it out. And I'm really humbled to be here to be able to speak to you about this. And I'm also really humbled to be able to speak among a lot of Canadian as well as like uh, national uh, entrepreneurs and creators. I am happy to be here, but I'm also talking to you guys at a crossroads in my life and my career. Uh, I know what it feels like to burn out and uh, it sucks. And I've been working for enough time to know that the burnout truly is real and I can recognize when I'm feeling positive about my work. I can recognize when I'm feeling really defeated and I can recognize like when I need to make a change. Uh, and I definitely could sit here and ramble on about like what it means to have a career and how to construct your identity. But I think the most important thing is to focus on what changes need to be made today for the future generation of designers and entrepreneurs, as well as a way to combat or discuss uh, change within social media and technology spaces. In many ways, I think our culture really has romanticized being busy, uh, whether that's doing overtime at your job or taking on too many freelance clients. Uh, we live in a space where the more accolades that we can add to our resume, the better. And that's how we are able to present ourselves as people who are doing good or being successful or making money or buying new things. Uh, it's all about saying, like, I'm too busy to hang out. Or, like, uh, like, I really would come out to your birthday dinner, but I've got a deadline that I have to make tomorrow. Or, uh, I only slept two hours last night. 
and these bags under my eyes are really visible, but they're cool because I'm busy. Um, so to set a framework for my current career and why I have all these opinions and thoughts about, uh, you know, this industry, I want to take it back to 2008. And 2008 was kind of where I got my start and really started thinking about uh, the potential for change and entrepreneurship in my life. Uh, but it was also a strange time because my work looks like this. It was 2008, so this was, it was cool in 2008. Um, and I looked like this. Once again, it was 2008. And I had a business called Plastic Skyline. And Plastic Skyline was a vintage uh, shop that sold uh, reworks and also sourced vintage clothing. And it was during a time where Shopify wasn't commonplace, so we were hard coding every single product page by editing uh, like every single customized field. And we were promoting on MySpace and LiveJournal because we had nothing else to promote on, like maybe Facebook, but that didn't make sense. So Plastic Skyline was uh, an interesting time in my life, but it was the first time where I realized that, oh, like maybe I could make a career out of this. But ultimately, I didn't know what I was doing. I was 16. Like, I don't. no one knows what they're doing when they're 16. And that uh, sense of being naive really translated to a lot of my success, success back then and also uh, to this day because the internet was such a young, new space. And at 16, there's no repercussions to mistakes. But that said, I was still uh, taking out the money that I was earning from the online website uh, and hiding it under my mattress because I was really ashamed of doing something different back then and you know when you're 16 all your friends are working part-time jobs at the mall or at like McDonald's and I didn't want to be different I was doing this because I was genuinely interested in the opportunity to I don't know participate in a space that no one else was participating in but I felt a lot of shame around that because I didn't know what being an entrepreneur meant. I didn't know what freelance meant because I grew up thinking that when you get older, a career is simply defined by wearing a business suit and going into an office and getting there at 8 a.m. and leaving at 5 and being tired and then making dinner. Like that was this very like traditional model of career that we all grew up uh, understanding in school. So since 2008, there's a lot of things that have changed. That includes technology, which means now we all have smartphones, and back then we didn't. We had Blackberries or something like that. Uh, connectivity has changed, uh, meaning that now meeting strangers online isn't so weird. When you are posting pictures of yourself wearing vintage clothing that you're selling on the internet, sometimes uh, parents get concerned because they're like, why are you putting pictures of yourself on the internet? Versus now we've got Instagram where we're constantly sharing everything that we're doing. Uh, perspective has also changed a lot since 2008. And it, that's a direct result of the above two items. Thinking that now smartphones and social media have enabled us to change our visibility and our insight on who we are as people and how we connect with those around us. And then of course the economy has also changed. Uh, and as a result of all those three things, now there's increased job opportunities and a different way that we can re reallocate money and funds uh, across different sectors from a corporate perspective to a freelancer perspective. So now Instagram is seen as a massive asset for growth, opportunity, and connectivity. And I think that in terms of my work, that opportunity to connect with people and to produce personality-driven content as well as digital storytelling has really uh, allowed me to set a service-based industry aside uh, in a, a market that is very much based off of traditional. So now we are emboldened to try different things, wear different hats, access new information, and explore often arbitrary avenues. And I'm about to go into my work currently with Castrum Pollitz. Uh, but to preface that, I just wanted to say that uh, a big part of my success is really being able to explore and uh, study this changing industry. And I feel very like fortunate and privileged to be able to 
have the chance to fail and have the chance to uh, try different things without feeling judged or uncomfortable in those spaces. So this is my work and my priority when it comes to work is really diversifying and exploring as many different avenues as possible. Uh, and social media is a huge part of doing that. My universe is comprised of these four things. Uh, the first being Castro and Pollux, which is what I'm centering this presentation around. Uh, and that is a design and marketing studio, as Fernando said, uh, based in Toronto. Uh, I also have a hair salon called Level 10. And I have never been interested in working in a hair salon, and I don't. But it's the first time that I've been able to actually have physical space and hold physical space by myself. Um, so my interest in starting or to be partners uh, in this hair salon was to feel like I could apply my branding and design skills into a space that other people could interact with without associating that to me specifically as a person. Uh, so outside of that, I also teach at a college called Sheridan, uh, just outside of Toronto, and I teach design uh, in a class called Professional Aspects. It's a fourth year course that basically prepares young designers to go out into the real world, even though the real world is muchly defined by uh, getting a stable design job. So that brings me to my last business, which is called School. And school is a direct response to this very traditional educational system because school is a online uh, educational platform that basically speaks directly to creative entrepreneurs to help them advance and diversify their skill set uh, regardless of what their degree says on paper. So if I went to school for, let's say, drawing and painting, but I want to learn how to uh, become... I don't know, a architectural renderer, I could potentially go to school and take a class to learn how to use the software. So I'm not necessarily an architect, but I can look at this as a new skill set that might inform or help advance my drawing practice. So generally, my work and perception of what it means to be a designer has largely changed based off the opportunities that social media has afforded me. And I think that my universe uh, of different jobs and avenues has really uh, helped me realize that because I'm not necessarily following a traditional model of what people are meant to do. I'm just trying to help myself realize that there's opportunities for me as well as those around me. Castor and Pollux's work combines marketing strategy and design with built-in distribution via social media. Uh, so going back to my history, uh, I went to school for graphic design in the school that I'm teaching at. And when I was in school, I really felt isolated from my peers because I wasn't looking at design as a way to be the most technically competent in terms of kerning type. I was there to connect with other people and to see how I could alter a school brief to be something that could be serving to me in my portfolio instead of just having like work that looks like schoolwork. Uh, I wanted to go into fashion and that's why like having these fashion businesses like really helped me be part of that world. But I'm a strong believer that with all the information that we have access to via social media or even Google, uh, we don't need to feel defined or um, like prevented from trying new things um, as a result of what our education has told us. Castro and Pollux has the capacity to bring a project to life without the overhead of a giant agency. So what does that mean? Uh, in Toronto, and I'm not sure what it's like here in Valencia, but in Toronto, we have a bunch of like skyscraper agencies and national agencies that have these very robust teams that promise all of these great returns on projects. So when it comes to a corporate client being like, who do I want to hire? This agency with like literal physical space or this small independent agency that's kind of scrappy, but a larger risk than someone who's really big. 
uh, I use this to my advantage or my disadvantage. I realize like if the clients that I'm trying to speak to don't want to work with me because I don't hold physical space, then those are probably companies that aren't progressive in thought or willing to understand how we're living in a world and uh, a design industry and space that needs to change and accommodate people like me or like you guys uh, who want a fair chance at being able to have those opportunities without feeling like they're being uh, confined to these very traditional nine to five roles. The services that we offer really range from installation and activations to event production, branding, art direction, content creation, etc. And all of these things aren't things that anyone needs to go to school for specifically. Uh, I like to diversify my portfolio because an installation project can inform a branding project. The way that I can see uh, creating a brand identity for someone new uh, could be informed by an experience that I had in a U-Haul truck uh, trying to set up an installation or something that I saw while I was traveling. Like all of these collective experiences can really like help shape our understanding of what design looks like and what entrepreneurship looks like as well. A priority that Castro and Pollux really likes to emphasize is that we bring digital content to real life conversation. And I know this sounds very vague, but anything from a branding project where people or consumers can interact with a brand for a store or watch a video and have a conversation about that or be able to experience photography uh, at an event. Uh, all of those things are able to work together to create real authentic conversations that uh, I think are important to have because all of these projects were done with a nimble team. They weren't done with a huge production budget. They weren't done uh, with the intention of looking uh, like we had a team of 20 doing them. Like the fact that we're able to post these projects on Instagram, for instance, and be able to have a conversation with an audience that wasn't able to like physically experience something. I think that's the future of marketing and design, like being able to not just follow these templated formats of what a brand needs to look like or how a brand functions, but more so being able to actually connect with consumers so they can understand the story that went into building that brand. And then on the flip side of that, we also bring physical experience to digital content. So what does that mean? Again, uh, event production, for instance, like how can we open up the conversation to be beyond just having an exclusive media event? How can we engage the public or followers that uh, follow me or my work to bring them into a space to engage and like meet new people and also like understand truly like what our projects are looking to push out? Um, whether that's uh, a set that we build uh, that acts as like a photo booth at an event or uh, even a physical artifact like a magazine which we publish. Uh, all of these things like not only build brand awareness but they also are learning experiences because I can see how consumers and audiences connect with my work and what I need to do better and that holds me accountable and also responsible to be promoting the right things within my design work. I think a lot of the, the success that we've had is really accredited to having an open mind. And I know this might sound very generic, like just keep an open mind and you'll be good. But I really think that being flexible is so important in creative industries and questioning like why you're doing the work and what that means on a larger playing field and to, to other people who are looking at your work. As a designer, you shouldn't just be making something to fulfill a need. We should be telling stories and we should be asking a lot of questions and making sure that those stories are present in all the work that we're doing. Uh, one project that I want to talk about is Biannual. And Biannual is an outerwear company uh, that I was asked to be the creative director of. And I worked with a manufacturer to basically create a brand story. So I named the brand, I came up with the packaging, I came up with like the brand ethos and intention, and then I kind of sat back and watched it grow into something that I didn't think that it could ever grow into. 
So whether or not that was uh, like a lookbook or like physical artifacts to like help promote or sell those coats to consumers or to retailers uh, or set uh, style of photography to use on social media or producing lookbooks. Uh, Biennial was a really interesting project because it was the first time that I was able to look at something that hasn't even been started yet and see like how I could actually like tell that story and weave that narrative throughout every single uh, artifact of like printed collateral and also product itself, as well as the web experience and the, the social media presence. Uh, then this past February, I worked with an investing uh, technology app called Wellsimple. And Wellsimple, I don't know if you have this in Valencia, but it basically, tries to bridge the conversation between consumer and uh, what it means to invest. And I think in a lot of ways, like investing is a really like intimidating space. Money in general is a really intimidating space because there's this perception that in order to invest, you need to have like thousands of dollars. But what Wellsimple does is make the conversation super easy and accessible. So you can invest $10 and see how that grows. And understand that saving is a critical part of like our everyday life so to help them bring that conversation to real life we created a newsstand uh, to support the launch of their new magazine so this newsstand was basically plopped down in the middle of a very like busy retail concourse in Toronto and we also brought this to Vancouver in British Columbia and the the design of the space was meant to look super inviting familiar and also non-intimidating because when you think of money maybe you think of the bank and you think about your like negative experiences with the bank or how like isolated you felt uh, this was meant to basically be the opposite of that so to capitalize on that new sand concept we also designed a bunch of collateral which included anything from like a biodegradable plastic bag to chocolate bars to gum to lottery tickets and all of those things were curated and designed to fit within this space that was obviously meant to be photographed, but also meant to be interacted with. And uh, these are some photos that we took that we also used as digital content across our social media to promote uh, the fact that this installation existed. Uh, once again, bridging that conversation between digital and then real life interactions. And then just one more throwback for you. Uh, this was me in 2016. And this was a project that we did for a property management company in North America called Oxford. Uh, and this space lived in a mall. And it was really interesting because I had never designed anything like for physical space before. So I was a 2D designer trying to design in 3D. So I made these in Illustrator and I was like, I don't understand perspective drawing. Like it was just so complicated and confusing. Uh, but this project came to be because the mall wanted us or me to promote uh, the opening of the largest like Zara in that area. Like I know that you guys have had Zara for a while, but back in 2016, uh, I feel like people were just really excited about it. So they were like, can you take some influencer fashion photos for us? And I was like, I don't, I don't think that's what I want to do. How about I build an installation? And the mall people were like, do you know how to do that? <laughs> and I was like, sure. <laughs> but like, I had no idea what I was doing. And it ended up looking like this. Um, it was basically a 200 square foot space, once again, plopped in the middle of the mall. And it was divided into three different rooms. And each room was meant to provide a lot of different like photo opportunities. And people who were either passing through the mall or visiting the mall specifically to see this installation had a chance to win a $500 gift card. And this incentive also spoke to and kind of not mocked, but really highlighted this obsession that our culture has with documentation and uh, sharing stories and sharing pictures of yourself online. So to set this example, I uh, actually showed how you could engage within the space. So there was 25 potential like photo opportunities. And then as a response, we were able to track 
who used a specific hashtag on social media to be able to enter to win uh, this contest. So across the five-day lifespan of this installation, we saw over 400 photos being uploaded to Instagram, which was a little bit shocking to me because on paper, I like the idea of building something really arbitrary and random, but then to see people actually come in to visit and to engage with that space kind of set something off in my head. And I was like, oh, like maybe this formula could work. And maybe that wasn't necessarily to my benefit because after that I was like, damn, I can do anything, uh, which like definitely isn't true. But I think this speaks to our collective consciousness, watching people like me do these very random arbitrary things uh, that you don't have a background in doing and then being like, yeah, I could totally do that too. Uh, so what does that mean in a space where at the same time, freelance also equals fear? There's a huge adversity and like hesitancy to be a freelancer because we're living in a space where like we want stability. Like we want to be able to know that we can pay our rent, that we can, you know, eat out at a restaurant if we want to. And we also grew up with this idea that like, if we're creative or existing in creative spaces, we're probably going to be a, script, a struggling artist. Uh, when I was growing up, my best friend was super book smart, super academic, and she was good at math and science. And I was like the token creative kid who was like drawing a picture in the corner and like not going out to recess. And my teachers definitely looked at me like I would not have the same trajectory as someone who could be a doctor. And I'm not saying that like my work can save people because that's definitely not the case, but it's in terms of economy and income and stability. And I think that's all we could ever want is just to know that we're going to be okay. Uh, as a professor teaching fourth year students, I see the fear in my students' eyes as they're about to graduate. And uh, they're thinking about like, what does this mean? Like I literally just paid thousands and thousands of dollars to get this education, will I get a job? What they don't realize is that getting a job isn't that complicated. Uh, they just might not get the job that they want. There's a lot of opportunities for designers to adjust their skill sets to suit the needs of uh, any job in order to survive. Uh, but when you say to them, like, there's other options for you, you don't necessarily need to go work at that suburban agency um, as a junior designer. Maybe you can do that um, to satisfy like your need for stability, but also maybe you start to delve into potential freelance projects. And they're like, oh my God, freelance? No, I don't want that. And it's just so interesting because these are like 20 something kids who literally grew up with a smartphone in their hands. They didn't necessarily experience the same things that like, I experienced growing up uh, not knowing what the internet was for a, a long time and like climbing trees and I don't know, being outside and not just on my computer. They literally have lived this experience of seeing people like Kylie Jenner who are listed as Forbes um, like youngest billionaire, like self-made billionaire. Like those are people in their realm and in their space but yet they still are like, I can't do that for myself. Like I need to get a traditional job. So why as an industry and why as people who have the power to promote change and growth in this industry, like why are we perpetuating this idea that uh, we need to be struggling artists in order to be like happy or fulfilled within our work? Um, and then why must we praise the self-starter while also displacing them with our in within our industries? Why do the people who work those very traditional, like stable nine to five jobs where they like climb up the corporate ladder and become creative directors and make $100,000 or more a year, why do they look down on freelancers as like lesser than? And why do large corporations acknowledge that freelancers exist, but at the same time not give them the same opportunities that they do to the people who are in those skyscraper buildings? I think that has a lot to do with ego. Uh, is our collective ability to pursue any avenue just driven by ego? Uh, and in terms of like my generation or millennials or Gen Zs, like is that just as a result of us being more driven than maybe 
uh, like Generation X. I think this is a lot to do with our environment and the spaces that we're growing up in and the, the industries that we're trying to navigate and trying to infiltrate. This entire keynote came to be because one of my friends was trying to empathize with like my anxieties and like the fact that I was burned out by saying like, oh yeah, Danny, like that's just like what being a freelancer is like. And I started to really think about like what that meant. Like if I'm an entrepreneur or a business owner, does that mean I'm a freelancer? In my head, I have so many responsibilities. I am responsible not only for like my uh, like comfort and income, but I'm also responsible for a team's emotion, emotions, like trying to make sure that the people who work on projects with me are happy and fulfilled, trying to make sure that I have jobs coming in, trying to make sure that clients are happy. Like, does that make me a freelancer? And then why does my perception of what it means to be a freelancer so negative? Like, I'm sitting here talking to you about like, how we need to promote and lift up people who want to take alternative routes to uh, careers, but at the same time, I'm trying to displace myself in an industry that's already displaced. So what exactly drives experience, worth, and value in the design industry? It's kind of hard to quantify, because on one hand, when you like quit your, let's say, nine to five jobs and become a freelance, everyone's like, damn, you're so brave. And you're just like, yeah, I'm brave, but like, am I going to make it? Can I pay my rent? And then when you prove everyone wrong and you succeed at like not having a quote unquote stable job, everyone's like, oh my God, you're really killing it. Like, good for you. Like, you're just killing it. And how many times have I heard that? And I'm like, please stop like isolating me from just being like a normal, like hardworking person who's just trying to be happy instead of praising me when you're not praising the people who are working these like very stable jobs, uh, who are growing in that space and like doing really good work. Like everyone really wants to highlight people who are self-made or self-starters, but at the same time, like those jobs are so hard to come by. How do we like normalize that and just like create equal opportunity for everyone across the board instead of trying to like, I don't know, create this like weird disconnect so where does that sit? And is doing many different things with no defined job title the future of what creative industries look like? Where will we be in five years or 10 years? In 10 years, uh, like in the past 10 years, so many things have changed. Uh, is it as a result of social media? Social media really does embolden us to do what we want to do. And it also should, when you think about it, empower young designers to keep pushing the needle forward. But we really need to stay curious and we really really need to stay nimble in order for that to actually be the reality of things. So I encourage everyone to really like support this change because we need to promote more diversity in the ways that we allocate jobs and opportunities um, so we can help see uh, or help shape how we each see ourselves within this industry and also shape how corporations and clients can see our worth and value. The self-starter sh or freelancer should not be a trope or a type, and we need to push for progress to make this seen be seen as normalized instead of subver subversive. Everyone should feel seen because of their work and their intentions and not because they fit within or outside a templated system. Uh, so let's make hustle, hustle, hustle uh, just evolve into doing good work with good intentions and making sure that we're all holding responsibility to ask ourselves why we're doing things instead of just burning ourselves out to try and press or to tr or try and fit within what we think success looks like. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, my website is Castro and Pollux uh, and my Instagram is Daniesk or you can check out my personal work at dannyroche.com. Thank you for having me again.